Hello, BookTube. I had another appointment very, very early this morning uh, in downtown Boston, and it's my last of the year, and once again, I wanted to treat myself to something enjoyable <laughs> since I was doing that, so once again, I went to the Brattle Bookshop, which is uh, just a, a block away from where I was. It's a used bookstore uh, in downtown Crossing that is amazing, just amazing, full of used books, full of variety. They're out buying all the time by the truckload. So you can never tell what new thing you're going to see in the store, either at the buying table right as you walk in the door or on the shelves if you happen to miss a day. <laughs> in addition to that, there's a sale lot outside that is cramped with books, just of every type and description and every condition too. Unlike the sale lots of many used bookstores where they put the junk outside, the Brattle doesn't do that. There's, you can get plenty of books that have still decades worth of life left in them out there and that have been put out there for one reason or another. The, the staff at the Brattle is whip sharp. So on that buying table, if they if a box comes up from the basement and they open it and they look and say, well, in another used bookstore, probably these things would be ten dollars a piece on the shelf inside the shop. Here, we know exactly what we need and don't need. We know exactly what goes and doesn't go, and these can go in the sale lot. It's a great way to build a library. Uh, and uh, I'm filming from a different location here, I, despite the fact that I've got big new windows and lots and lots more light. Uh, you need the sun to cooperate in order to have any natural light at all, and it hasn't been cooperating lately. Uh, and even in this new location where I'm filming, I, if you look over my shoulder, you will see a large number of books that came to me from publishers, but you'll see a large number that didn't, and almost all the ones that didn't came from the Brattle, <laughs> from the, that sale lot. I am a regular inhabitant of that sale lot. Nothing better than getting a $1 book that you know you're going to keep for the rest of your life. Or, and also, nothing, nothing really matches the freedom to explore. I'm old enough to remember when a retail bookstore offered you that freedom. When you could go into a retail bookstore and for $20 you could come out with a pile of books. That isn't true anymore. So now, if you're, if you, God forbid, you don't have a really good used bookstore near you, or for instance, a really good library, if a retail bookstore is the only source for you of brick and mortar, actual hold in your hand printed books, as it is for a lot of people in America, I know that for sure. A lot of rural Barnes and Nobles are the only source for books anywhere around. Uh, if, if that's the case, then you can't afford to experiment at all because each book is $10. <laughs> uh, that's not true with the Brattle. You can get an armload of books for $10 if you're, if you're patient enough to give the sale lot its due. Um, and I did that <laughs> today for the last time in 2020, I went to the Brattle and browsed around and I got a pile of books that I want to show you. <laughs> and there's a familiar refrain here. And, uh, the first two scratch an itch that I have been scratching in the whole course of 2020 is with the help of the Brattle Bookshop. Uh, and that is murder mysteries, little mass market paperback murder mysteries, the type of thing you read in an hour and maybe forget and maybe reread and need to get to page 50 before you realize that you've read it already. Uh, I found two of those, uh, both of which satisfy the, the little niche within a niche for me of being English murder, village murder mysteries, that sort of thing. I find that I, I really enjoyed those in 2020. Uh, and I make a point when I when I'm exploring the mystery, murder mysteries. Uh, the Brattle has a huge number. When, when I make a point when I'm exploring them, of uh, trying to to explore authors that I'd never heard of before, or that I've heard of but I've never read, or that sort of thing. Often those are doorways to a whole ecosystem. Often the the, the author of a slim murder mystery that you've never heard of wrote twenty slim murder mysteries that you've never heard of. So if you like one, it stands to reason you're going to like the others. Uh, we'll see if that's true with this one. I think this author is, is probably prolific. I get that impression from the blurbs on the book. This is a, a mass market paperback called Frog in the Throat by someone going under the pen name of E.X. Farrars. Um, and it, it's a, a village mystery. Uh, Virginia Freer is enjoying a brief holiday at the cottage of old friends Helen and Andrew when her estranged husband Felix comes knocking at the door. Painful memories turn up with the irrepressible Mr. Freer as does his penchant for prevarication, petty theft, and amateur sleuthing. Virginia is suspicious of Felix's sudden appearance, but she never suspects his light-hearted snooping into the secret sins of a pair of literary sisters, a wealthy widow, 
A popular poet and a love-struck bachelor will turn so deadly serious until murder gives Virginia and Felix a frog in the throat. <laughs> and the, uh, the cover blurb about E.X. Farrars says, She is a lovely British lady who makes her living from murder. <laughs> she has been poisoning, strangling, knifing, shooting, drowning, and bludgeoning people to death for over 40 years. <laughs> Uh, and each time she has delighted and intrigued her readers with her ingenious murders in the stately homes and quiet country cottages of England. Right up my alley. Tiny little thing. Won't take any time at all to do, so I will do it today. I'll read it today. And then the, this next one is, uh, oh my, my ergonomics here is, I don't have a place to, well, that's all right. We'll figure it out. Um, the next one is far more ambitious. I'm sure that you, you know this yourself from if you read murder mysteries. Some of them are like this where uh, in, the, in an English country village, somebody dies a violent and unexpected death. It's always the village organist. Uh, and then someone has to solve it. And it's fairly by the numbers, and you are enticed by the, by the author to figure it out alongside them. And then it is solved, and you're on your way. Uh, other murder mysteries are more ambitious than that, much more ambitious. And one of the ways that you can tell that is that they are always longer. And this one is a Megillah. It's, it's very long. It's a UK from the, it's a UK mass market. That's the thing that drew my attention to it. And it's by Phil Rickman, who I swear I've read before. I think he's probably mind-bogglingly prolific, and probably there are a million books in this series. But this is the first one. Uh, this is a Marilyn Watkins mystery called The Wine of Angels in a UK mass market there. Uh, and it's, it's, uh, it goes like this. A paradise parish of cobbled streets and timber-framed houses a huge and haunted vicarage, not what the Reverend Merrily Watkins ever had in mind. Nor had she wanted to walk into a local dispute over a play about a curious 17th century cleric accused of witchcraft, a story that certain old established families would rather remain in obscurity. But this is, now the name of the place is Ledwardine. Uh, but this is Ledwardine, steeped in cider and secrets. And also, as Merrily and her teenage daughter Jane discover a village where horrific murders are a tradition spanning centuries <laughs> so it's a big thing and it's got it's got literary quotes to start off every chapter that's always the kiss of death that's when you know that the author has literary ambitions but i have read some literary murder mysteries that turned out to be very good and I'm, i have high hopes for this certainly i love the uh the choice of protagonist uh presumably middle-aged reverend and her and her uh her teenage daughter that's that's kind of neat. I, the, the prospect of watching them solve crimes uh, is enticing. So, uh, so those were the two mass market murder mysteries that I got. I got two of them. They're my last two of the year, unless I get one in the mail. I don't. I don't think I'm going to get any mass market murder mysteries in the mail. Uh, and then, oh god, oh god, I've got a catastrophe going on here. Because and it's all because I had I, I thought I had staged all this perfectly well. I I am not a grown up booktuber. <laughs> Maybe someday I will get the hang of this. I thought if I brought a stool over here to put things on to show you, that, that was all the work I needed to do. But what I actually need is not only this stool to take things from, but also a platform to put them on. If I'd been a professional booktuber with ring lights and and uh, fairy cords in the background and some copyright free music, I would have known that. Instead, I'm bungling all over the place here. <laughs> Anyway, uh, we'll move on. This next thing is from uh, the 2013, I think. 2013, yeah, and I don't remember it. I could easily have read it. It would have taken me 20 minutes, but I'm going to ponder it a little more slowly this time. Uh, it's this. It's Alexander McCall Smith, who his name will be familiar to a lot of you because he also writes a series of murder mysteries. Uh, and it's what W.H. Auden can do for you. It's a tiny little thing that is not... It's, it, that's not a trick title for another murder mystery. This is just his meditation on the works of Auden. And I have a big, I hauled on this channel from the battle, a big, uh, the big famous collected Auden poems that I have been slowly working my way through with a great deal of mounting appreciation. A great deal of it. I have been rediscovering Auden in 2020 in a way that I didn't think was possible. Uh, and enjoying the heck out of it. And I, I maybe the fact that I hadn't done that and largely dismissed Auden when this came out. Maybe I, that caused me to largely dismiss this too, but when I saw it, I had to grab it. <laughs> Absolutely had to grab it. I have met Alexander McCall Smith a few times. I've talked with him a few times. Uh, not at author groups, not at author signings, the, the way so many booktubers do. I just don't do that. 
Uh, maybe I should. Maybe I should have back when they were possible. Actually, I, that, and in technicality, they were at author signings, but I was proctoring them for my bookstore. So it wasn't, it wasn't that I was waiting impatiently in a long line in order to get up and say, your work's meant so much to me. <laughs> Instead, I was chatting with him for 20 minutes before the whole thing started and then chatting with him for 20 minutes after the whole thing was over. Only uh, a couple of those times, the, the after party, or not after party, but when the last person was gone from the line and the event was over and uh, the venue had, was, had closed the doors and we were packing up whatever remained of the books, uh, a couple of the times our conversations lasted a good deal, a good deal of time. If he if he had uh, no pressing engagement afterwards, just an evening party to go to, uh, then sometimes our conversations lasted a good deal longer than just the, the formalities. Uh, it was emailed after one of those conversations went on at some length and left. I was I was there with a young person from the bookstore who knew how to run the till, who knew how to run the, the credit card machine. Technically, we were supposed to both know how to do that, but I was really there just to talk to the author and to the, guy, the, the people at the library and to the customers in line. My job, pretty much, anywhere, on-site or off, was to talk with people. <laughs> uh, with, uh, I was after one of those conversations. I was emailed by his publicist, who, uh, his then publicist, who said, "You know, that never happens." <laughs> he he went on and on about the fact that he never encounters someone to talk to, that he in encounters instead well-meaning but completely empty-headed bookstore people, bookstore kids who uh, empty-headed is the wrong word, but completely inexperienced in reading. They don't know they don't know anything at all. They've never read. Auden or Larkin or Shelley or Keats or Byron or anything like that. They've never read any P.G. Woodhouse, much less able to quote it. They just, it's, it used to be once upon a time, a long time ago, that the people that you got from a bookstore were the people who knew that. Young or old, they were the people who could keep up those conversations, who loved those conversations. But as, as this author himself told me, the, those days changed. They went away. And now I, I felt sorry for him. By the time that long conversation was done, his, his publicist emailed me after the fact and said, my, my. <laughs> so that was, that was uh, uh, the highlight of his, of his little event today was talking to you about books, and not his own books. Uh, but it was heartbreaking to listen to him talk about how in some bookstores he is perfectly able to speak the language of books with the people who are there, but that at an increasing number of bookstores, no, no, just the, all the, the good intentions in the world are there, but no common language, none. Even people who haven't read his own books, so that, so that the bookstore doesn't even have that to field somebody. I felt for him, I really did. The paling of that atmosphere is one of the many reasons why I left retail bookselling. Uh, but I got the impression from those conversations, I have never had much patience with his uh, number one ladies detective agency. I've always thought they were very much tossed off left-handed exercises. He has never really gone out of his way to characterize them otherwise, <laughs> to, to be honest, you know, to give him credit where it's due. But I'm perfectly willing to read uh, you know, a quick and disposable murder mystery if I get the feeling that the author put their heart into it, cared about it. If I get the feeling that they didn't, that they're just that they're just tossing it off. John Creasy was the same way. He was once you've read five of his murder mysteries, you get the impression that he's not even present when he's doing it. Uh, but I got the sense in those conversations that this was a, a, a real good thinker about books so I, I if I ever read this I dismissed it out of mind completely because I didn't recognize it at all and now it's the, now it's the perfect time to do it because I am giving Auden the, the serious attention that I think a book like this would probably need as a requirement ahead of time uh, then this next book is a rebuy I've bought this many 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 times I've had it in hardcover many times I've had it in mass market paperback many times I always manage to give it away uh, to people and as a result I don't have a copy I, I have an electronic copy. I have an ebook copy of this, but I, I am building a little shelf of physical copies of these books. Not many books. Ebooks are fine by me for most things, but this is the, the Mask of Apollo, another Mary Reynolds novel. We just I just recently hauled uh, uh, the Prey Singer, and I have Fire from Heaven, and I have uh, the Last of the Wine. I have a mass market paperback of The King Must Die. Uh, and this is about a character named Nico. Um, uh, 
Nikok Nik Nikoratos, I think, is the name of the main character. I haven't read this in decades. Nikoratos, I think, is his name. Nico is how we know him. And he is a professional actor, only out of a very different world. Acting was absolutely crucial to ancient Greece, but it was very different in a lot of ways from what we know today. And as usual, just like in the idea of a professional bard or poet in The Praise Singer, Mary Rennell brings that world to life. Absolutely brings it to life. Makes it real. Makes it livable. What was What were the the uh, pragmatic technicalities like of having only three people to do a Euripidean drama, for instance, swapping out masks and getting on and off stage. What are the technicalities involved there? If you have a long speech in one part of the drama and then you've got to speak again as another character in just a minute, how does that actually work? Wonderful stuff. Who knows if it's actually accurate, but it feels wonderfully real. And Nico himself as a character feels wonderfully, wonderfully real. Uh, even down to the point, there's a point later on in, in the book, uh, midway point or maybe two-thirds of the way through, where he has a fever dream about a great play that he's never heard of, that he's never read, that he's never played in, about a, uh, a prince who is instructed by a ghost to avenge his dead father. And it, that, that the book has little theatrical gestures like that all throughout it. So I was happy to find a hardcover. I will, I'm making a little shelf of these things. And I am assuming, because of the serendipity of the brattle, I'm assuming that uh, I'm finding all of these from the same person. I'm assuming that somebody sold 15,000 books for the brattle, and in those 15,000 books was all of Mary Reynolds in hardcover, and that I'm just encountering them as they come available. Because all this stuff is boxed up and brought to the shop, and the boxes shift around. They don't always come up in the order in which they go down. So. But I'm very happy to find this, and I'm very happy to re to revisit this pencil in hand, get all the good stuff once and for all, and then put them on the shelf. Even though I have ebooks, and I love the ebooks because they are really convenient. If I feel like reading, I did this actually for uh, the Last of the Wine, um, just the other day. I, I I was I was reading in bed. I was perfectly comfortable, and I indulged in one of the freedoms that an e-reader gives you that pr printed physical books don't which is that I was in bed, I was perfectly comfortable, and I suddenly had a yen to read the beginning of The Last of the Wine. And instead of needing to get up and hunt around, I didn't have to do that. I could switch right to my ebook library and just find it and start reading it. So I don't, I'm not, not knocking them, but some books you want both. I think. I do anyway. Uh, then this next one is something that I believe I have hauled on this channel before. I think I hauled it from the Brattle years ago and got rid of it, mailed it to one of you. Uh, but I really like it, so I, I, in the back of my mind, I kept, I made a mental note to keep my eye open for it to, uh, to get a copy when I found it again. And it's this, it's Patricia O'Toole's The Five of Hearts, uh, a hardcover edition, a, a group biography of a group of, of friends that, an unlikely friends who, who found each other, uh, at the turn of the 20th century. It was, uh, Henry Adams and his wife Clover, there was John Hay and uh, his wife Clara, and there was Clarence King. Uh, actually, John Hay is right over my shoulder. You can see there, right next to Reagan, there's John Talafiero's great biography of him, All the Great Prizes. Uh, that, that book right there, that is Hay's face right on top there. Uh, it's, a, it's a terrific, terrific biography. And this is great too. It's, it's a, a necessarily different than a biography devoted to just one person. And uh, King, really sticks out here. He was an oddball in this group anyway, but he really sticks out. What a life he led. What an amazing, weird life he led. Uh, deserves a great big biography of his own. Maybe he has one and I don't know about it, but uh, uh, the, quite a bit of it is covered in this book. Uh, so it would be a pleasure to revisit it. I haven't read this since I hauled it the last time on this channel, and I'm interested in all of these characters. Uh, but Patricia O'Toole does what she can, but she can't really stop Henry Adams from coming across as a monster. Most of these collective biographies do. Sooner or later, I will get a great, there will come along a great big fat one volume biography of Henry Adams that does a truly balanced job. I don't think such a thing has happened. There was a multi volume biography of him that came close, but it was a huge undertaking. I'm talking about one big book, and maybe it will happen. Uh, to, to put him back in the spotlight, there was Gary Wills' book, Henry Adams and what was it, the birth of American freedom or something ridiculously pretentious like that, that had some good insights in it. But I'm talking about a soup to nuts biography. This is not that. The Wills book was not that. Uh, but this is still 
wonderful. It's just so quotable on every page uh, of little little bits and pieces here and there. Insights of the author. And uh, fantastic portraits of, of the Hayes. <laughs> John Hay and his wife. Those are just the standout portraits. Uh, so I was happy to find it again, and maybe I'll keep it this time, especially since I still have this weird pandemic-induced phobia about going to the post office willy-nilly every day. So maybe maybe I'll keep it. Maybe I'll hold on to it this time. Uh, then this next one is uh, something that I have meant to have over and over. I've meant to find this, find maybe a, a cheap paperback or something like that. And it's been in the back of my mind. I've never really acted on it. And then I saw it at the Brattles today for a dollar. And, you know, and that's was, was a perfect serendipity with the Brattle. It's Nick Hornby, 10 years in the tub. And it's uh, it's a, an anthology of a column that he did for the Believer magazine forever, uh, which he what he's reading, just about what he's reading. So books he's bought recently, books he's read recently, things, ruminations that have struck his mind while he's reading. And I remember every time I ever got an issue of the Believer, I didn't get many of them because it struck me as clickbait in magazine form. Twee to the extreme. Just Dave Eggers has a lot to answer for. <laughs> but uh, every time I got an issue of it, I always remember thinking, well, that his column was the only good thing in this issue, and I'm not going to save it. And I'm not going to save the issue, it's, but that was that was as far as book columns go. I have over the course of the last 450 years, I have had occasion to write many many kinds of book columns, and it's harder than it looks. Uh, people think I will just you know open up a document and wool gather for for a thousand words. It's harder than that. Uh, if it's done well, it's harder than that. And I remember thinking he did it really well, and this is a whole collection of those columns. So. I'm absolutely all for it. This will probably be the thing, this and the murder mystery, probably be the thing I'll read first. Uh, and then the last thing, uh, which was the find of the day and uh, a keeper. I, uh, the Nick Hornby might be a keeper in this pile and the Mask of Apollo obviously is, but uh, you always hope to find keepers at the Brattle, but this thing definitely, this goes on I, sooner or later. I was gonna say which shelf it goes on, but my books aren't in any kind of order at the moment. <laughs> I imposed just briefly. I, briefly, it was bothering me so much that I took five minutes to put uh, the American Revolution, some American Revolution books together on this shelf here, but not all of them, and haphazardly, so very annoying. Uh, but when I do finally get my books in order, I will have a shelf for Boston books, and this will be one of them. This is by Harold and James Kirker, and this is Bullfinch's Boston, about Charles Bullfinch, not Thomas Bullfinch, the author of my beloved Bullfinch's mythology, but his father, Charles Bullfinch, the great architect, a, a, a man who did more than pretty much anyone else to shape great federalist boston so many buildings so many houses the boston common the old state house just so many signature things that you can if the more you know about bullfinch's style and the more you know about boston history the more you can just look at a building and tell the people you're with that's a bullfinch and here's why i know that and this is uh, a story of his career which <laughs> had its ups and downs he, there are all sorts of bullfinch landmarks all over Boston and all over New England. Uh, the Great Ether Dome at Mass General Hospital. I, I, I've been under that dome many, many times, and that was that was a bullfinch creation, a whole bunch of other things. Uh, this book is a study of those things, but also a very good biography of bullfinch, who led a weird life, not as weird as Clarence King, but still, uh, Clarence King passed a, led a double life as a black man. It's tough to top that for weirdness, <laughs> but but uh, but Bullfinch, when he was young, when he was one of my boys, when he was eighteen to twenty-five, he was absolutely gorgeous. I don't know that there are any portraits of him that survived from those years, but and you'd never know it from the crabbed old thing that he became. But when he was my my target age, he was gorgeous. Uh, Would have made a great booktuber. <laughs> uh, but his life had lots of ups and downs, mainly because, much like yours truly. He had a ter he was terrible with money, just terrible with money. Some people have the knack and some people don't. It's nothing to be ashamed of, but uh, I am terrible with money and he was terrible with money. He was 10 times worse than I was, 10 times worse than I am. Couldn't keep two sous together to save his life. Uh, no matter how many commissions he had rolling in, he, and he would often, knowing what he was like, he would often ask for his whole commission up front and get it because he was so well known, because he was the greatest architect in the world. And it still didn't help. <laughs> it still didn't help. Probably the lowest point and the most ironic point of his life was when he was actually put in debtor's prison. 
because he was so much in arrears. Uh, I mean, Clarence King was always in debt as well, but Charles Bullfinch just couldn't keep a household running because he was always in debt. And one of the, one of the neat little uh, details from his stint in debtor's prison is something you could probably see coming a mile away, which was he designed the prison. <laughs> And then he ended up living in it for a while. Uh, but this, this, the the Kirkers were twin brothers, and they they have a harmonious, collaborative writing style. This is just a terrific Boston book. It's very focused, but it's a terrific Boston book. It is it is a book that belongs on a Boston shelf, and I will eventually have one of those again. So so that was my trip to the Brattle. Tremendous fun. I left behind a lot because I was only ca I was carrying these things myself. Uh, but we have. Bullfinch's Boston, long since time I had a copy of this in, in my permanent collection. And Ten Years in the Tub, Nick Hornby's Columns from the Believer, uh, The Five of Hearts, Patricia O'Toole's uh, collective biography of Henry Adams and his circle. Uh, and let's see here, I don't want anything to fall. Uh, the Mask of Apollo by Mary Renault, the little Mary Renault shelf that will eventually take shape. Uh, then we have uh, What Can W.H. Auden Do for You? Uh, which I will devour and then shelve next to that big Auden collected poems. Uh, then The Wine of Angels, which is the very first Marilyn Watkins mystery uh, from Rick, uh, from Phil Rickman. I think there are probably a lot of these. Uh, and finally, uh, Frog in the Throat by E.X. Ferris, who I've never heard of. It's just, it's just a shot in the dark. Uh, the, the, those two, the murder mysteries, are shots in the dark of the type that you can do when you have a, sh a shop like The Brattle, where... Uh, costs are so reasonable, <laughs> where everything is so reasonable, so you're never out of a lot of money. Uh, but then the last thing that I want to show you before I wrap this up and go in search of sunlight uh, is mail. It, well, I got back, there was one forlorn package sitting on the stoop. Uh, so I thought we'd do that and uh, top off the mail column that way, see what this is. There won't be many, uh, many more mail packages this year in addition to the pandemic which has been bad enough, uh, publicists are going to start uh, leaving their desk. They're not actually leaving their desk because their desk is in their living room. But they're going to start signing off from their official accounts and just put work out of their mind until the new year. And they should because they have worked really hard in 2020 to keep some semblance of normality in the book world. They are, they are heroes, one and all. So if they want to take three weeks off, that's fine with me. Uh, Let's see here. Okay, so this is from Flatiron Books. This is Tales from the Hinterland by Melissa Albert. Finished copy of Tales from the Hinterland, uh, where the author opens a door to a brutal and breathtaking fantasy world in her first ever short story collection. In this book, the author introduced uh, the author first introduced the Hinterland through the Hazel Wood series, which captivated audiences everywhere, earning 10 starred trade reviews and spending a total of 40 weeks on the bestseller list. Never read them. Uh, now the long-awaited fairy tales that inspired Alice Prosperine's death and twisted adventures take full form in this mesmerizing collection. Okay. All right, so my first question is going to be, will this make any sense to me if I haven't read those other books? I guess I'll give it a try and see. Uh, well, I won't give it a try right away. It's from mid-January. This comes out in mid-January. Uh, so, I'll get to it if I'm back to reviewing books in the new year. <laughs> and if I'm back to reviewing books in the new year, I'm really going to want to get over that phobia about may about post offices. Uh, so, along those lines, if there's one of you out there who has read all of the Hazelwood books and loves them, and has and just been waiting for a new book, well, this is a collection of short stories set in that universe, it sounds like. If you want this... It, it sounds like it'll be much more up your alley than it is mine. All the more so if you're willing to write a review of it uh, for me. <laughs> so, so let's get those conversations started again. But uh, we'll add that to the pile. That is a January 2001, 21 release, so I don't need to worry about it. Whereas I'm going to eagerly consume most of the rest of these books right away. So I'm going to wrap this up for now. Uh, but I'll be back. Thank you, BookTube.